this is weird. It's been a goal of mine since the earliest days of the channel to make a video for every game in the Sonic series. And because of how long it's been, I have scratch pages going back years, full of ideas for videos I might still not make for years. Every time I've ever started working on a Sonic retrospective, I've always gone into it with a pretty good idea of what I want the video to look like, because I've been brainstorming on it for so, so long. But not this time. Not with Sonic Rush Adventure. I've played it before, I have the game, I've had it since the year it came out, and I know very well why I got it. <laughs> the fandom wasn't going to let me not buy it. The first game had been the catalyst for me dipping my toes back into the series after a couple of hard times, and while I was still a little trepidatious by 2007, I was definitely paying attention again. And among fans back at release, Rush Adventure was widely considered more than just a good game. It was often described to be the best Sonic game released since the Blue Blur's glory days. Yeah, fans are always trying to get back to those glory days. But it sure didn't hit me that way. It didn't hit me any which way as far as I can tell. For a long time, whenever the subject of this game came up, I would, with confidence, explain that I dropped it about two or three levels in, because I, quote, didn't like the music as much. After literal years of making this claim, I popped in my cartridge and found that I had actually gotten much further than that. I had come within a breadth of actually finishing it. So, as I write these words, all I can say is that I do not remember Sonic Rush Adventure. I have vague, blurry memories of a game that didn't enthrall me the way its predecessor had, but I don't think it's fair to make any particular claim beyond this. I didn't finish it, and it's been so long that I don't know why. But I bet I will. Let's get critiquing! things jump out at me right out of the gate. The first is that despite being a sequel, this is clearly taking a completely different tonal approach than the original Sonic Rush. The second, relatedly, is that the scope, budget, and general resources for this project have gone through the roof. Sonic Rush was an early release for a handheld that was, hard as it is to believe now, struggling to find its footing at the time. Its opening was very brief. Stylish! Funky, but brief. Rush Adventure opens with an original vocal theme for a handheld game, along with a fully 3D opening. Right from the word go, it blows anything seen in the previous game out of the water. Adorable low-poly models, great use of posing to show characterization, setting the tone for a light-hearted, swashbuckling adventure. And it sets the tone well. Even the art is noticeably much cuter than it's been in eons. The skies and seas are cobalt blue, and the stakes are never too stressful. Rush Adventure plays out like a breezy vacation episode of a Saturday morning cartoon. But it's an involuntary vacation for the heroes. We open on Sonic and Tails, flying on the tornado, investigating mysterious energy readings. But when they hit turbulence, they suddenly get pulled down into the land of darkness. No, sorry, I mean, they get pulled down onto the Lost Hex! The Starfall Islands! <laughs> no, wait, that's not it either. It's... It's Australia. Sega is contractually obligated to introduce new characters with every Sonic game. This was the only mainline title where they don't. And Rush Adventure is no exception. This is Marine, a seven-year-old raccoon with a precocious curiosity, a relentlessly positive disposition, an undying thirst for adventure, and more ridiculously stereotypical Australian phrases than you can shake a kukri at. I love her! Marine is a great contrast to the more experienced adventurers in Sonic and Tails, serving to both highlight the duo's friendship in a way that hadn't really been much of a focus in a long time, and giving the two of them someone to contrast against. Their whole dynamic is just delightful, although it is kind of funny that everyone treats Marine like a little kid, but not Tails. Although, thinking on that, I guess almost every character in the series is technically a child. <sighs> Franchises for kids, huh? 
The writing just feels a lot more lively this time around. And it's not just because it leans on campy archetypes, although boy does it. We've got a whole new set of antagonists this time. Captain Whisker and his scurvy crew, and he is exactly what you think he is. A bumbling hornswoggler who speaks exclusively in the most bog-standard stereotypical pirate phrases imaginable. I love him! And huh, yeah, Whisker and his crew are all robots, I can't imagine what that could mean. Honestly, laid back as it is, Rush Adventure is definitely missing the edge of its predecessor. It's less of a kiddie anime, and more of a kiddie Saturday morning cartoon, if you get that distinction. But a lot of Rush's edge came down to its soundtrack. It's like I said back then, Sonic Rush would not be Sonic Rush without the incredible music of Hideki Naganuma. And so it follows, for better or worse, that Sonic Rush Adventure is not Sonic Rush. Naganuma wanted to compose for it, but he wasn't allowed to, and that we missed out on a second Naganuma score has got to be one of the biggest tragedies in the history of the series. Tomoya Otani and his team do fine work in his place, of course. They would go on to score just about every Sonic game to come out since, and one of their biggest strengths is their sheer versatility, managing to be a perfect fit for a series that's anything but consistent. They always match their score to reflect and enhance a game's tone, no matter what that tone is. This is no exception, as the music backs up the swashbuckling vibe while still emulating a lot of Naganuma's flair. Emulating it more than I thought, really. I swear some of these chord progressions are direct homages. Either way, it might not be Sonic Rush, but it's still great stuff. On that note, I've got good news and bad news. The bad news is that Rush Adventure fails to fix one of the worst aspects of the first game. Sonic and Blaze still do this. Maybe the reason it took me so long to notice all the Rush homages in the soundtrack is because I couldn't hear them! But the good news is that this sequel does address, more or less, all of the original game's other shortcomings, all while massively expanding on it in ways expected and otherwise. The basic gameplay mechanics are mostly unchanged. The core verb of the game is still run, and the central mechanic is still the boost. You still got two characters, the stylish trick system, and mid-air abilities, and although these have been noticeably tightened up, this is a refinement, not an overhaul. The difference really comes down to the level design. Where Rush's skill floor was at the altitude limit, and its level design was lousy with literal pitfalls, the sequel flattens that out into something that's still challenging but rarely unfair. Where the first game's level layouts frequently hit the same beats over and over, Rush Adventure stages feature so, so, so much more distinction. Not just among themselves, but even within the series. A forest of giant mushrooms and living trees that fling you into the sky a pirate-infested ancient city with trebuchets that launch you through derelict walls, a crystalline cave where you'll ride minecarts full of columns jewels in two different dimensions, and way more stages with actual water. The team had clearly gotten the hang of both Boost gameplay and the DS hardware, and so they approached this project with so much more finesse. You remember back in the Rush episode how I kept wishing that considering the game's plot was all about Blaze's dimension merging with Sonic's, we could have spent any time at all in Blaze's world? I solemnly swear that when I wrote that, I had no idea about this. Rush Adventure takes place entirely in Blaze's dimension, and it absolutely awesomely reveals that a few levels in. Sonic and Tails had no idea until Blaze herself showed up, and neither did I. Sonic and Blaze no longer have their own separate campaigns. Instead, you can choose which of them you'd like to play on a per-level basis as soon as Blaze joins the crew. Differences between the two are still fairly minimal, but they have been further emphasized. Sonic is noticeably much faster, while Blaze is better at mid-air tricks, has a much larger attack radius, and is immune to fire. Really, setting the game in her world is so flippin' cool, and with the benefit of hindsight, I actually quite like that they saved that for the sequel. Certain areas could be seen as alternate dimension analogs to places from Sonic's history. Marine's home is a familiar-looking locale called Southern Island. We find a forest of bouncy mushrooms and the remnants of an ancient civilization in a crumbling city above the clouds. Oh, and you better believe I fist-pumped when this happened! Snow levels are one of my top two level tropes, and this seriously might be the coolest snowboarding sequence in the whole series. And the bosses? Wah! They all now make effective use of both screens, feel so much more creative and fair, and they're each a lot of fun in their own right. 
It says a lot that Rush Adventure's weakest boss is the one based on a design from the original game, and it's still a huge improvement. There's also a T-Rex that crashes through the topsoil and sends you plummeting into an underground chamber. A whale that you have to stun and venture inside of to find its weak point. What is this, an N64 game? A giant robot pirate skeleton? Yeah, the bosses are probably the standout example of taking something that sucked about the first game and doing it right. There was plenty of room for improvement, and they did not miss that opportunity. I will say, though, the color palette of some of these stages is a little flat and a little repetitive. Uh, maybe Dimps was still used to designing for the GBA screen or something, but there's a lack of contrast here. Like when they hit, they hit hard, and the game looks beautiful at its best. But there are a few too many stages with dull backgrounds and just a lot of greenish or brownish palettes. I don't mind having two pirate-themed levels in a game where pirates are the antagonists, but I can't even tell at a glance if what I'm looking at here is Pirate's Island or Haunted Ship. Speaking of, why in the world does the last level of the game, which takes place in the pirate's hidden stronghold, feature such uncharacteristically bouncy music? It doesn't feel like I'm storming toward the end of the game. It feels like I'm... Uh, yeah, that. I kinda wonder if they didn't swap Pirate's Island's theme with Blizzard Peaks or something. And I'm sure this is more of a me problem. But as someone who was intimately familiar with Sonic Rush's idiosyncrasies, and actually loved its cheap difficulty, smoothing out the challenge for the sequel made its stages, frankly, a little underwhelming. They're still fun, but aside from this one tough part in Sky Babylon, I never really got that satisfying sense of overcoming a teeth-gnashing obstacle that I love so much. It's not to say they're perfect on that front, of course. Cheap deaths might be less common, but they do still happen occasionally, especially when you try to stay airborne for too long and wind up flying over the thing that you were meant to land on. And sometimes it's like my Twitch reactions tell me to try to dodge an obstacle I'm not supposed to dodge, and I wind up paying for it. Really would have helped if they could have put the trick button on something that didn't jump. More often than not, though, situations like this that would have surely led to a pit in the original game just bounce you down to the lower path in this one. I still think sanding down those rough edges was definitely the right call, of course, but sometimes it feels like I spend most of every level with my boost meter maxed out, and I selfishly kinda wish we could have ratcheted things back up toward the end. But I like trial and error game design. Nonetheless, Sonic Rush Adventure shows that the original's rough edges were mostly just the result of an uneven first attempt. That it was, and is in fact, possible to design levels around the boost mechanic that don't fall into the trap of trial and error, and that don't use and reuse the same kinds of geometry to the point that they blend together. It's a classic video game sequel, where the teams worked out the kinks in the first game and execute on a follow-up that makes their first attempt look like a rough draft in comparison. This is quite oddly the first time any of the Dimp sequels had ever been such a pure follow-up in terms of gameplay mechanics, and Rush Adventure reaps the benefits of that iteration. The stages blend the best elements of modern Sonic with that old classic magic, and the result is a game that's far more accessible, far more fair, and for all but the most masochistic players, far more fun. It also makes replaying these stages a breeze, and they better be. You almost certainly are going to be replaying them. Because all of this, everything I've talked up so far, all of these aspects that would make up the whole of plenty of other Sonic games, that is only one piece of Sonic Rush Adventure. It's not just a collection of unique zones nebulously linked together by a narrative. It's a Sonic game with the word adventure in the title. And following that tradition, it expects you to spend a great deal of time playing a game that is not a speedy platformer. While that's going to be more off-putting for some people than others, what makes or breaks these concepts for me is how well they're executed, how well they complement Sonic's gameplay, and at the end of the day, how much and whether I enjoy them. Is it fun and rewarding in its own right, or is it just something you kind of put up with to unlock more of the real game? The two halves of Rush Adventure are nicely intertwined. Every time you finish an act or a boss, you get materials. How much of it you get is based on your rank. Now, as soon as I saw this, my eye twitched. I'm actually allergic to crafting systems and action games. I can't stand them. But this one's not like that. Tails just uses it to build vehicles and tech to help progress the campaign. So replayability isn't just encouraged this time, it's required. 
I mean, probably. I think if you manage to hit S ranks your first time through every level, maybe you wouldn't have to? Either way, I actually don't mind this at all. The idea at the core of Sonic's whole design is a game that gets more fun the better you get, so as long as it doesn't become a grind, gaining progress behind something that'll make the player want to replay the stages and get better at them makes a lot of sense. It's a surprisingly elegant little system, considering that nothing else in the whole series does anything like this. And it helps, it really helps, that the material requirements are never particularly high. I always felt like I was just dipping back into a stage that I wanted to get better at anyway. It never felt like grinding, to a point. But that's just how the system works. Let's talk about how you engage with it. The bulk of the other half of Rush Adventure is spent on, or sometimes in, the open sea. And where the first game barely made use of the DS's touchscreen, this one capitalizes on it. At the beginning of the game, you're given a sea chart. Almost all of it is uncharted. You'll need to get on board one of your four aquatic vehicles, each controlled with a touchscreen, and each playing differently from one another. You draw a path of your choosing out into that blue ocean, and a mini-game plays out during your travel. If you happen to hit an island or a story event in that time, you'll have the option to play it. If you hit nothing, you just come back to port empty-handed. This is where the entire structure of the game could have so, so easily gone wrong. Plenty of games have gone wrong by leaning too hard into touchscreen gimmicks with no finesse. And on paper, the way I just described it there, this sure sounds like it's gonna be a chore to deal with. But here's the thing. For starters, you are never at a loss for where to go. You can break off and explore if you want to, but the game always makes it abundantly clear where your next destination lies. Or your next destinations, as the case may be. You do get choices as the game goes on. But much more importantly than all this, they actually remember to make all of this stuff fun. Let's break it down. The first sea craft is the Wave Cyclone. It controls with the same snappy feedback as the original game's special stages, but it's way more robust than that. There are trick ramps in the water, and you build up boost by collecting rings and pulling stunts, which lets you blast through obstacles. Unfortunately, it's limited by its short range, but well, I wound up spending a lot of time with it anyway. I'll get back to that in a second. Next, we've got the Ocean Tornado, a larger vessel focused on combat. It features a Gatling gun, cannonballs, and a flamethrower. They all feel fun to use, and they all specialize in taking down different kinds of enemies. One pitfall that a lot of DS games fall into is trying to oversimplify things by tying everything to the touchscreen. But Rush Adventure doesn't make that mistake. You can swap weapons by tapping them on the screen, but you can also just do it with the D-pad or the buttons. Same with the water bike, the boost works by double tapping, or by just holding the L button. And smart decisions like these keep the controls from being unwieldy. Next up is the Aqua Blast, and if I had to pick a least favorite, this would probably be it. It turns a little slower than the water bike, but adds in a laser cannon, and a spin cycle move that can deflect enemy projectiles. It's not bad by any means, it just splits the difference between the speed of the water bike and the combat focus of the ship, and I like both of those better. So last but not least is the Deep Typhoon, a submarine that takes you under the sea to... Well, to play Elite Beat Agents, complete with its own rhythmic soundtrack, which awesomely incorporates sonar pings. All four of these vehicles get their own unique gameplay, mechanics, enemy types, abilities, and even music. It might not be quote-unquote traditional Sonic gameplay, but it does complement it surprisingly well. And swapping between four completely different games while I was exploring kept things feeling fresh. I mean, there are entire DS games that aren't as robust as the High Seas Adventure portion of this one. I also want to give credit to the visual design of each of these vehicles. Tails' inventions are always a treat, and it's a great showcase for him to get to see and use so many of them in one game. Like I said, Sonic and Tails' partnership really shines here. But I did say earlier that pushing out and adventuring is worth it. And while that's true to a point, it might also contain Rush Adventure's biggest flaw. Actually, the game's biggest flaw is probably just the fact that the only time it ever autosaves is when you beat it. Other than that, you have to remember to go to the menu and manually save, or you'll lose all the progress that you've made. This sort of system was still commonplace when I started gaming back in 1874, but I bet a lot of kids lost a ton of progress because they didn't remember to save, or their DS battery died. Autosaving absolutely was the standard by 2007, and I have no idea why Rush Adventure doesn't do it. But anyway, venturing off the beaten path will lead you to two things. The first are hidden islands, short, bite-sized pieces of levels that tend to be focused around a single gimmick. 
Or sometimes they just blatantly reuse layouts from the first game. A Sonic game reusing level layouts? Well, I never! Seriously, they also tend to be quite a bit tougher than the main stages. That kinder difficulty curve isn't really a thing here, but they net better rewards for it, including different combinations for materials. And because these are so much shorter, you'd think they'd be great for farming materials if that's what you need to do. You would think. But perplexingly, none of the hidden islands ever contain the material that you find in, like, the latter half of the stages, which really does limit their utility in the long run. The second thing you find out there, and probably the more important, are Emerald Challenges. Essentially this game's version of special stages. You race Captain Whiskers' right-hand Roboman, Johnny, on the Wave Cyclone. The first one to the Emerald gets to keep it! Uh, well, unless Johnny gets there first. Then you can just retry the stage again as many times as you want to. This presented a problem for me. The first Emerald race I found was the first one, and it was a happy fun time to Royal Cakewalk. But because the game lets you explore at your own pace, the second race I found turned out to be one of the very last. I actually went into this challenge of relishing it. It was immediately obvious how much tougher this was, but I figured if I could work up the skill to overcome this one, the earlier ones would be easier. I like trial and error gameplay. And this time, that almost killed me! Beating Johnny took me literally an hour. He has so many advantages. His craft is naturally faster, he can drop bombs behind him. If you slam into his craft, you can't get by it, but if he does the same to you, you lose half your health. But at last, I got on a really good run, and I pulled ahead of him at the end, and here we go! This is it! Yes, 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 yes! Anyway, I'm gonna go play Sonic Heroes now. Hey, this isn't actually that bad! No, no, I did get him eventually, by which I mean I looked up a video where someone else did it and followed their route. Yeah. You know, back in the early 1860s, before even I started gaming, this was what they used to call Nintendo hard. Those insane gaming challenges where there is exactly one right way to do it, and you gotta be perfect to earn it. But I was proud of myself, you know? I love overcoming stupid challenges through grinding my own skill, and I figured now that I've done that, I was gonna blast through the rest of them no prob. And then I found another Johnny race. And it was just as impossible! And so I put it on the back burner, hit the rest of the main campaign, got the first of the game's two endings, knew it was time to go find the rest of the emeralds to unlock the finale, and then Tails told me this. The hour I had spent throwing myself at this race over and over and over and over again, there was no reason whatsoever for me to do any of that. In fact, I don't think I was even supposed to be able to do it like that. Because now, and only now, after I have finished every stage, now Tails tells me that he can upgrade the vehicles. And once you do that, even on that last stage, Johnny is a complete pushover. I don't care for this! For one thing, I had no idea I'd be upgrading the vehicles and the game gives no indication of it. I really think this should have been something that they let you do from the start. Because when you can't, it essentially makes venturing off the main route before you get that first ending a waste of time. Worse, it means you're going to be doing a lot of fairly aimless sea charting in a big chunk just before the finish line. Because you also have to find most of the hidden islands to unlock Blaze's missions for the Soul Emeralds. And remember what I said earlier about how they never contain materials from the later stages? Well, the real implication of that is that they never contain black material. Replaying Pirate's Island is the one and only place that you can ever get it. And virtually all of the vehicle upgrades require a bunch of it. That's why, in the end, it took me almost as long just to get the emeralds as it did to play the entire rest of the game. It was the one part of Rush Adventure that truly did feel like a grind. I don't understand why this stuff had to be so bifurcated. It'd be like if Metroid Prime didn't want you to collect any of the Chozo artifacts until you were almost done with it. So it'd be like Metroid Prime if I was playing it. Huh, maybe there's a reason I haven't revisited the Prime games much since I originally critiqued them. And this really wouldn't be so bad if there was something more substantial, like, say, a whole other level on the side of all of that. But now, it's just the final boss. I do like the dead obvious twist that Eggman and his alternate universe doppelganger were behind everything the whole time. 
complete with the requisite use of Sonic's longest-running unintentional joke, I get a kick out of the way that, contrary to most of the decade, here it's actually Eggman coming out of nowhere at the end. And then Tails builds one more vehicle to dig down to the planet's core. All right! And there's no minigame for it whatsoever. That's kind of what I mean about it being underwhelming. Getting here took literally hours of, well, work. Just exploring the sea chart, looking for emerald races, and playing hidden islands. And it's hard not to be a little bit let down by something so... rote. But maybe this wasn't really supposed to be the kind of thing you binged for, you know? I think as a game critic, it's very easy to fall into this trap where you want and need to finish a game for a review, so you get annoyed by anything that takes too long or gates your progress to a degree that a regular player probably wouldn't. Maybe the intention was just to give the game some more longevity. I can imagine myself as a kid getting months of additional playtime out of slowly exploring the world, uncovering more islands, replaying the stages, upgrading all my crafts, and finding the emeralds, rather than setting down and trying to do it all in one marathon session. Sonic Rush Adventure is an incredibly generous game for the dedicated player, containing all kinds of little flourishes. Like how Marine's Island sports a different, gloriously catchy sea shanty for every vehicle you unlock. It has optional time attack missions for each vehicle type, loads of unlockable decorations for the island, and literally a hundred optional missions to take on, including hard mode variants of all the bosses. In comparison to most other Sonic games, there's just oodles of content to sink your teeth into. So if I try to see all this how Kid Josh might have seen it, and see the finale as a coda to an adventure that's more about the journey than the destination, rather than a reward in and of itself, I think it works a lot better. I've increasingly come to appreciate the value in trying to see kids' games the way a kid would. Then the very last scene of the game does something that kind of made my jaw drop. The characters speculate openly about the nature of the Emeralds. They brought Sonic and Blaze together again. They always seem to be trying to help the heroes, almost like they want to be used like this. For a set of gems that usually function as little more than a deus ex machina that can do whatever they need to do, a handheld spin-off delving into the lore like this sure was unexpected, and I've never heard anyone else mention it. But maybe that's because hardly anybody played Sonic Rush Adventure. Video game sales are always an imprecise measure, but every indication seems to point to it kind of being a bomb at retail. And this is curious. It appears to have sold less than half the amount of copies as its predecessor. Sonic Rush released at a time when the fat DS was the only one available, when the platform was still struggling to find its footing, and developers were still struggling to know what to do with it. But Rush Adventure released at a time when the DS was thriving, well on its way to becoming the most successful handheld game platform of all time. Maybe it had a lot more competition. Anecdotally, I can tell you that it didn't stay on shelves for long. I'm glad I got it when I did. But it's also possible that an entire generation's worth of increasingly poorly received Sonic games might have finally been catching up to the blue blur. A lot of Sonic games have fallen into relative obscurity, and a lot of Dimps games practically live there. But I can't think of another Sonic game this good that is less remembered. So why didn't I remember it? Why did I buy this game? play only most of it, and proceed to spend the next 15 years forgetting about it. Well, here's a clue. I got Rush Adventure on December 22nd, 2007. And if you've seen my earlier videos, and you're some kind of stalkerish TGC freak, you'll know that a mere four days later, I walked into a department store as soon as the doors opened at 6 in the morning, and walked out with a brand new Xbox 360. So on the day he bought this, Team Josh was just a few days away from playing this for the first time. He would finish Sonic's campaign two days later. While the credits were rolling, he would declare that the plot was great. He'd spend the waning months of his teen years digging deep, replaying Wave Ocean dozens of times, listening to a bittersweet song which Team Josh thought was about lost love, but which I now realize is about lost time. I was trying and failing to emotionally process what had happened to my childhood hero, and in a sense, what had happened to me. And yet, I didn't finish the perfectly fun, perfectly competent game that I'd gotten just a few days earlier. I just left it here. One of these games felt painfully relevant to where I was in my own life in 2007, and it wasn't the one that was good. But the other difference is, shallow as it was, 06 didn't make me feel like I was playing a game for kids. When I was a teenager, I didn't want this series about a super-fast cartoon hedgehog to feel like it was for kids. 
<laughs> which was an awful place to be when they were literally the ones dubbing the games. If a Sonic game was too lighthearted, too cartoony, if it didn't take itself seriously, I think I felt a little awkward about playing it. This is, I see now, a big part of why Heroes felt like such a betrayal to me. How dare they make a Sonic game for children? Back then, I think elements like the seven-year-old sidekick, the cheesy dialogue, heck, even the corny opening song, it all just made me a little bit too self-conscious. Suffice to say, I'm glad I took the time to revisit this game through a more actually mature perspective. Sonic games can be fairly serious, high-stakes affairs, or it can be light-hearted, swashbuckling fun. It can be everything in between. Sonic's versatility and adaptability is its strength. But back in 07, even though people were pointing to Dimp's handheld releases as something the main series should be striving to emulate, they did little to quell a sentiment that had been growing in volume for nearly a decade at that point. Why can't Sonic just be like it used to be? After all, they said, these were the titles that broke Nintendo's monopoly and made Sega a household name. These were the masterpieces that defined everything Sonic was and is, they said, supposed to be. So why is it that even 2D Sonic has to keep implementing boost modes, team-up characters, and emphasizing speed over momentum? Why does Sega insist on innovating so far away from what brought him to the dance? Dimp's next Sonic title would be the one to answer those questions. It would be the most important, high-profile game they ever made for the series. And we'll talk about that somewhere down the road. Because next time, I'll be going back to waggle some more for one of the very few Sonic games I have never played. Sonic and the Black Knight. You can see it right now, a week early, for just one dollar on my Patreon. Thanks to all my backers for making this possible, thank you for watching, and until next time, you keep geeking, I'll keep critiquing. Hooroo!